Welcome to PSI's webinar, Engaging Phonics and Word Recognition Instruction. Hello, I'm Karen McKelvey, PSI's Director of Professional Development. And on behalf of all of us at PSI, we are pleased to host Dr. Rosinski today for his third in a series of literacy instruction. School achievement is crucially dependent upon effective literacy skills. And this webinar will assist you in the important facet of phonic and word recognition. PSI partners with hundreds of schools via our school psychology staff, intervention specialists, special education staff, gifted ESL and remedial teachers, and a wide variety of school health staff. Along with all of you, we consider of paramount importance the positive achievements of the students with which we work. PSI is pleased to have among its resources such expert partners as Dr. Tim Rosinski to train not only PSI staff, but also to provide professional development to our partner schools. Dr. Rosinski is a professor of literacy education at Kent State University. He has written over 150 articles and has authored, co-authored, or edited over 15 books or curriculum programs on reading education. He is co-author of the award-winning fluency program called Fluency First. His scholarly interests include reading fluency and word study, reading in the elementary and middle grades, and readers who struggle. Before I turn the program over to Dr. Rosinski, I want to say that we will be recording this session and it will be archived for further usage by our registrants. If time allows, you can submit questions that will be answered at the end. Utilize the control panel on the side of your screen using it much like an instant message. Upon completion of the webinar and submission of an evaluation, you will receive within a week to 10 days a certificate of completion via email. We will also post the PowerPoint on the PSI website within a week or so. And now, PSI is pleased to present Dr. Tim Rosinski. Thanks, Karen. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining me on this uh, webinar uh, workshop day here in uh, Northeast Ohio where it looks like it's we're going to be getting some snow. Um, really excited to talk about today's topic. Your Karen or Tammy if you could uh, switch to the first uh, slide for for me. Okay there we go. Engaging phonics and word recognition instruction. I happen to be a word nerd so this is something that really is right up my alley and I spent a good part of today actually uh, um, looking over assignments from my students. I teach a course here at Kent State called the Effective Teaching of Phonics. So this is something that's been on my mind uh, for at least the last 15 weeks or so. So I usually start my uh, presentations, whether it's in the classroom or a webinar, with the next slide, a little model of reading that I put together. Um, I think that we pretty well recognize that if you're going to teach reading and be successful at it, there's three main components we need to be uh, examining. Uh, the first and most important is the one there at the bottom, teaching comprehension. We need to teach our kids comprehension strategies that help them make sense out of what they read. Well, we also need to work on reading fluency. That's an area that I've spoken on previously. The ability to recognize words automatically and effortlessly and to read with good expression or prosody is what they call it. And then that top one, word study. Uh, that includes phonics, word recognition. Phonics and word recognition for me are pretty much the same thing. The ability to, to sound out a word given its written representation. Uh, but also word study would include spelling, uh, which is the opposite of word decoding. Uh, it's encoding and vocabulary word meaning. And that's the one I'm going to focus on with you today. So if we could turn to the next slide, you see that big fat arrow point, pointing at word study. Uh, uh, there. So that's today's focus. If we have 15 to 20 minutes per day to devote to word study, spelling, vocabulary, phonics, what might be in that word study component? But first of all, what does the field think about? That's okay, you can keep going, uh, Tammy, to the next one. What does the field think about? Uh, word study. Well, every year the International Reading Association puts together a group of experts and these experts identify what are some of the hot topics in in reading. Uh, and for this most recent year, I'd like to share with you the results, at least in the topics we're talking about today. Next slide. Uh, phonics uh, was identified as not very hot. 
phoneme make awareness is not very hot. And even vocabulary word meaning at the very best was identified as a, a somewhat hot or a lukewarm topic. These are topics that are not considered in the field all that important or at least all that uh, relevant. And yet I think it's pretty obvious that a person's going to have difficulty in reading if they can't sound out the words or even if they could sound out the words and they don't know what the words mean. Uh, I, I just I don't know how comprehension can possibly ha uh, happen. But why is it that these topics related to words are are uh, you know so ha you know ha are being dismissed as such? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. One is perhaps the way it's being taught now. Uh, if you look at the next slide here, uh, this is very typical. You know of the old workbook approach, the worksheet approach, where students are you know given endless sets of worksheets and asked to you know, fill in the blank or if you look at the next uh, slide another worksheet these are ones that I just got off the internet uh, you know a little bit of this kind of stuff is okay but when when it becomes the uh, the primary source of instruction I, I think where students uh, interest in in words and phonics can easily be diminished another approach that often is used is the old rote memory approach to word recognition and vocabulary next slide um, you can see this, my son Michael. I think I've used this in other uh, presentations I made, but you know that he would be given 20, 30, 40 words a week, and his job was to look them up in a dictionary, memorize the spelling and the definition, and uh, he would take a test on Friday and and usually got an A or B, but had them forgotten by the following Monday. We want kids to engage in lifelong love of words and certainly this is not the way to do it. Not only is this list of words that my son had uh, too many words, so it was about 50 or 60 a week. If you look at the next slide you can see what those words look like. Restive, reverie, roseate, rueful, sallow, sardonic. Folks, he was in fifth grade when he had this worksheet uh, and I'll be honest with you, <laughs> I don't even know uh, unless the definition was there, I don't even know what half of those words would have meant. But you know, just because a word's hard doesn't mean it's worth teaching. Uh, that's for sure. It's well-meaning, these kinds of activities. I'm not going to put those down, but they're not terribly effective. So we're going to look at some ways today. You know, I kind of pulled a, I wrote a book called The uh, uh, Effective Reading St or Fe uh, Central Strategies for Word Study. And I'm going to share with you just a few of the ones I think they're, are really important. Rather than these words that you're seeing here that are, you know, rarely used and rarely see, how about teaching kids more commonly used words? And so if we took take a look at the next slide, um, one of my favorite approaches, the next slide too, Tammy, is um, uh, instant words or high-frequency words. Uh, Edward Fry, great uh, literacy scholar, uh, several years ago identified the most common words that we use or encounter when we read. And if you want to find these, you can uh, you can go to any uh, search engine and type in fry, fry instant word list, and it'll get, it give you these words there. But if you look, this is his first 100 words. If you look there, beginning in the top left hand column, you see the words the, of, and. These are common words, and these are words you don't want to have to sound out. You want to be able to identify those words uh, instantly and immediately. Uh, let's take a look at the next slide here. Suppose you had here's some of these high frequency words. Um, and you were to check these with your students if they could read them, how well they could read them, say a second or third grade. And if you had students that could read them like this, <clears throat> van, f f first, wa wa water, bean, no, Ben, I would count every one of those as incorrect. What we want students to be is instantly recognize these words because you see them so often. They should be able to read them like this, then first, water, been called. Why? Because of that, seeing them so often, if you have to sound them out, you're going to have to use up too much of your mental energy. That should be devoted to comprehension rather than word recognition. I want to show you the power of these high-frequency words. Uh, next slide, Tammy. Uh, the first 100 that you saw just a, two slides ago, those words, those 100 words represent 50% of all the words we'll ever read for the rest of our lives. You can see why we want kids to learn those words as quickly as possible. The first 300 words represent about two-thirds of all the words we'll encounter. And if you looked at all 600 words from Ed Fry's list, you're looking at nearly three-quarters of all the words we'll ever, ever encounter. So those 600 words are, I would say, by the end of second grade. We want we don't want students to have these down pat. Now, how do you 
How do you learn these words? Well, you read a lot. Uh, you put them on word walls and you practice them every day. Um, play word games with them. In fact, if one of my favorite word games is is on the next slide. I call it Wordo. It's a version of Bingo. Basically, it's easy to make. All you have to do is get on your Microsoft Word program and create a a four by four matrix or a four by four chart like this. Then what you do is you find 16 words that you want to review or teach your students. And uh, here's an example here on the next slide. These are 16 words from the instant word list. And every students uh, will write those words on their card. They put them in a different order that is unique to them. And then basically what you do is you uh, play word out with your kids. You call out the word, you call out the definition uh, to the word, and uh, the children find the word. They put a bean or a counter over the word, and if they get five in a row, five diagonal, five across, they call out word -o, and uh, they get a short price. So the clue could be uh, this is something that you drink, and it begins with the letter W. A water so I'll mark that one this is when you put uh, several persons together you get the plural of persons or what people so you get the idea you're practicing the recognition of the words you're practicing the meaning of the words and so on I think I, I these could be science words they could be social studies words they could be uh, high frequency words that you could practice with your students and kids do find it quite engaging and, and enjoyable myself as a teacher I would love doing this with kids regularly as a way of reviewing words uh, so that's certainly something you can do with those high frequency words you know since we're speaking of games I'd like to share with you a game that my wife and I do every day for the newspaper it's on the next slide it's a uh, it's a word building activity this comes a couple years ago from the Akron Beacon Journal what they do in this game is they give you a word. Uh, in this case, you can see there the Saturday's word was eschewing. And the job is to think of as many uh, words as you can that can be made from the letters of eschewing. Some of you may remember doing something like this uh, in school yourself, perhaps. Do you remember when the teacher would put a word on the chalkboard? Uh, next slide, how about perhaps the word December? And the teacher might say to you, how many words can you make out of the letters of, in, of December? And you go for, hey, give, give the students 10 minutes and they could come up with as many words as possible. It, it's an anagram activity. It's where you play with letters to make words. But it's, it's, it's enjoyable. I remember having fun doing this with my classmates when I was a child. And, and it was enjoyable to try to make as many words as possible. And I was always pretty good at it. I was a pretty good reader. Here's some of the words that you could come up with from December. It's on the next slide. Certainly you could come up with simple words like me, bed, and red. But look at those other ones there at the bottom. Embed, ember, recede, decree, redeem. These are the words that are, again, going to build vocabulary and are also going to develop students' word recognition skills there. The problem with this activity done in the traditional ways where you give students a, a word like December and say, go for it, make as many words as you can, is those students who aren't the good readers, who, are, who don't have a lot, a high degree of proficiency with word recognition, they're not very good at that. They might come up with me, be at bed, and read, and read, but uh, that may be about it. What I love is is kind of taking this idea and, and flipping it. Uh, we, we talk about flipping uh, instruction nowadays. And so instead of saying, given to kids, here's the word, make as many words as you can, how about if we do something that Pat Cunningham has called making words? Next slide, please. I, I've come up with my own version of this. I call it making and writing words. Instead of giving the students the, 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 the word, what you do, December, what you do is you give the students a set of letters to begin with. Now, I'm going to share with you quickly a, a lesson I did here. But here's the way it would work. You'd pass this sheet out to every student you're working with. Okay. So these are third or fourth graders. And so and on the next slide, what you see is I, I, I already put in the letters that we're going to be working with. Uh, four E's and an I, and then those consonants on the left-hand side, C, two D's, three N's, and a P. And what happens is I am the teacher. As the teacher, I'm going to guide students to, to make words using these and only only these letters. And the last word we're going to make is going to be uh, a word that uses every letter. And so that turns it into another form of game where students try to figure out what might that last word be. So let's get started here. If you can turn to the next slide here, uh, Tammy. Look at the top right-hand corner uh, of this sheet. And 
what you'll notice is first of all these three little symbols and what those symbols are uh, are, are ways that I use to help kids help point out to kids various features in words so as I say we're going to make some words if we make any words that have uh, uh, a, a silent letter in them we're going to mark them with that no sign that zero with a slash through it if we make any words that have a consonant blend in them, we're going to mark those with a sideways V. And if we make any words that are rule breakers, we're going to mark those with a heart because those are words you're going to have to know by heart in order to spell and decode uh, accurately. Now, if you look at uh, box number 13 also, I've circled that, and that's going to be our last word. That's the last word uh, that we'll use every letter. You'll notice that I've also put X's and had the students put X's in boxes 14 and 15 because we're not going to use those boxes. So let's go, class. Uh, I've kind of kind of pre-recorded this, so I'll show you how it goes here. Box number one, what I'd like for you to do, if you remember in math last week, we studied this fancy number 3.14. It's a number that we use to measure the area and circumference of circles. It has a special Greek name to it. What's the word? Two letters, two sounds, and of course the word is pi. So the children will write pi in that box number one. And then what we do is we spell it out loud and we say it and we spell it. So pi, p-i, pi. All right. Then I go, let's go down to number two, write the word pi again. Now add a letter to make the real pi. We eat a Thanksgiving and, uh, uh, and the holidays. Oh, that's p-i-e, pi. All right. Now, uh, you, you, any symbol we should put there, and of course the E is not heard, so we put that uh, sim, that no sign underneath the E in box number two. Number three, now let's change the letter in pi and make something that happens to us at the end of our life. We die, okay, not a pleasant thought, but it happens to all of us, and now we move on to number four, and I say add a consonant to die and make a word that is a fancy word for eating supper. Sometimes your mom says it's time to eat supper, but sometimes she says it's dinner time, time for us to dine is the correct answer. Now let's add a letter to dine, I'm sorry, not add a letter, but change a letter in dine and make a word that is a small cube. It's usually white in color, sometimes it's red. It's had thoughts on it. It's used in games of gambling and chance. What's the word? And of course, again, the word is dice uh, uh, there. Now, it's interesting because on the word dice, uh, we some students might, without any other prompting, spell it D-I-S-C because they hear the S sound. But because there's no S up there in the consonants, they're forced to think of another alternative. And so it's a nice way of getting kids to think uh, uh, precisely of the, the appropriate letter, D-I-C-E, the C, not the S in dice. Number six, let's move on to the next column here. Number six, uh, change the letter in dice and make a word that describes somebody you might think of as friendly or helpful. Of course, the word is nice. So these are all pretty easy ones, but now, now we're going to start hitting some challenging ones. Number seven. Uh, I tell kids that number seven is going to be a heart word. There's going to be a rule that's being broken here. Add a letter to the word nice and make a word that describes uh, the, that describes a relationship between myself and my brother's daughter. I am Jane's uncle. Jane is my niece is the correct answer. And, of course, that uh, heart is necessary because the eye is silent. And the reason the eye is silent is because it's, you know, that, that old first grade rule. Remember that one? When two vowels go walking, the first one does the talking. Well, that rule is violated in that word, right? It's the eye is silent. It doesn't do any talking at all. So we put a heart there. And that little heart reminds us that that can be a little bit of a challenging word for us to remember to spell and also decode. Now we move on to number eight, and we're going to work on DE. It's a prefix. It means to undo or negate, so write DE in box number eight and add two letters to make a document that denotes ownership of something. If you buy a house or a piece of property, the, the county government would give you this thing called a deed. Very good. Now, we've, again, we put a little no sign under the second E in D because as a class, we decided that that's, uh, that second E was silent. You don't say D-E-E-D, it's just D, so that second E is silent. Then we write the word D in box number nine, and we add two letters to make a word that, well, I'm not exactly sure the meaning to this word, but it's a word that uh, you use to emphasize things, and it makes you sound really smart. Uh, what's the word? And, of course, the word is indeed uh, there. And so that word is... Uh, 
you know, notice the words are getting more challenging. In fact, we actually put the word indeed on the word wall. We put it on display because that's a word, I, it's a cool word, and we want students to learn that word. And we encourage kids to use that word as many times as possible. I still remember a couple of years ago when we did this lesson, we had <laughs> the next week and a half every time a child opened his mouth, the word indeed came out. Hey, Mr. Rosinski, I have to go to the bathroom. Indeed, I really have to go. And I would answer, indeed, you better go as soon as possible. Now, number 10, we start with the word D, or the prefix DE again, and, and we take the four letters in number five, dice, but we arrange them to make a word that means to, to choose or make a decision. Of course, that word now is decide. Okay, we've got the silent E and decide again. Box number 11, if we can move on to the next uh, uh, word, uh, we start with DE and we take uh, four other letters and make a word that means to rely on someone or something. To rely on someone or something is to depend, okay? And uh, in this case, you notice that we uh, put that little sideways V under the ND and depend because ND and depend is a, is a blend. It's two consonants that go side by side and you hear both of them and they're in the same syllable. And again, for any of us in the listening audience, you know, that's not a big deal. We know how to spell and we know how to sound out depend. But I'll be honest with you, I have students we work with in our reading clinic who would spell depend, D E P E N or D E P D. They're not really paying attention to that full blend there. And so it's a way of emphasizing it to our students. Only two words left to go here. Number 12, if you look there to the right of the box, number 12, I, I wrote the word deny. We can't really make the word deny because there's no Y in our consonant or vowel box. But what I told the kids was to start with DE and make the past tense of deny, denied. And what I said was to look at the first three letters in the box, box number seven, which is niece. Okay, the first three letters of box number seven is N-I-E. So the students put N-I-E after uh, D-E and then the end with a D sound and you end up with denied. Uh, there and and uh, I still remember if once when we did this, the student raised his hand. He said, "Mr. Rosinski, should we put a heart in that word denied?" And I asked why. Well, you had to put a heart in number seven because you had N I E, so we have N I E in box number twelve. Well, I turned it right around and I asked the students, "Should we put a heart in that word?" And of course, the answer was no. The answer is no because the rules work. I before E except after C and two vowels go walking. The first one does do the talking, in this case denied. All right, so you can see how this is done. Now the last word turns it into a game and usually I don't give the students any clue as to what that last word is except to say it uses every letter. But in this case students usually get the word because we do this word on usually the day before the 4th of July. Uh, there and uh, that, that of course they they are already prompted to know then that box number thirteen contains the word next slide please independence independence because of Independence Day and so that's the way the word or, uh, this activity works you end with that last word instead of saying class I'm going to use the word independence make as many words as you can uh, what we're doing is we're giving students the uh, uh, prompted, we're leading it through this instructionally as the teacher. So those kids, children who are having difficulty with spelling and phonics are are, uh, are given the instruction and the support necessary to be uh, uh, successful at, at this. By the way, I'll mention to you that uh, those, the 13, we made 13 words because, well, how many states or colonies declared their independence back in 7076? And of course, there were 13, and we tried to name those, and that's usually the biggest challenge of all. But the key to the lesson is taking the last word, so it could be independence, but you know, here in December, it could be other last words. It could be Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, uh, what is solstice, uh, winter solstice, whatever it might be. You think of all the words you can make out of the letters, and you put them in the order in which you want to teach them, and voila, there you go. You've got a lesson that I guarantee you will build phonics, spelling, vocabulary, and of course I think a little bit of students love the words. I like to give you a little bit of a, a help here. Now if you have a pencil or pen ready, I'm going to go to the next slide here, Tammy. And I'm, if you look at the top of the page there, you see this uh, website, wordsmith.org slash anagram. Write that website down if you got a second. If not, you can go back to this uh, seminar or webinar. Uh, when uh, it gets posted on the PSI website. 
but go to that website if you have a chance later on today and when you're there what you need to do is click on where it says advanced setting that'll be prompted and, and just click on it and then you'll be asked this question show candidate word list only answer yes to that question uh, I have no idea what that means but just say yes to it and then what you do there, you'll appear a text box and in this text box you type in your last word to be anagrammed so in this case it was independence I typed in independence and I like to show you what just what what came out of uh, of that next slide Tammy 59 different words appeared uh, uh, there now in in the neat thing is they put them in order from the shortest to the longest so you know if all you wanted to do is wor work with words like uh, uh, pie and end and din and dip listen folks I'm your guy I could come up with those but look at the on the left hand column these longer words words like uh, denied and decide and indeed and niece and folks uh, you know I the, the, I'm a pretty good reader and pretty good speller but it would still would take me 15 20 minutes to come up with all those words this website did it for me in about in about 30 seconds so in 30 what am I talking about in one second it does it for you so it really is a nice resource for your students there so that's a word building activity I hope it makes sense to you guys and I, I, I I'll, uh, and I, I can give you some other resources I'll pass them on to Karen and she can pass them on to you to, uh, to you as uh, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about this but let me share with you another word building activity that's one of my favorites here Isabel Beck talks about it in her study with colleagues from the University of Pittsburgh called focusing attention on decoding for children with poor reading skills design and preliminary tests of the word building intervention there's that notion of word building again uh, 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 here um, and uh, let, let me show you what this little intervention looked like here if you go to the next slide look there at the top there's three different lessons that students were given these are younger children who are having difficulty with this uh, with spelling and word decoding so the teacher would start with the word sat. The children would have these as letter tiles or on you know pieces of of you know slips of paper. And the teacher would say, class, that word is sat. Now what we want to do is go from sat to sap. Where does the sound change? And of course the children would say, Oh, the last sound uh, change is okay. Then take out the T and put in a P, and now you got sap, that gooey substance that comes out of trees in the springtime. Now what we want to do is take out the S and sap and replace it with a T. And what word do we get? And of course the word is tap. Now let's go from tap to the word top. Where does the sound change there in the middle? So take out the A and put in the O. Uh, that word means the opposite of bottom. And then, of course, we add a letter to make the word stop, the opposite of go, and on and on. So it's a little five-minute or so exercise in which students make words done on a regular basis. And it's real simple. It's manipulative. And, again, it has a game-like quality to it. Well, I'd like to share with you the results of the study that Dr. McCandless and Dr. Uh, uh, Isabel Beck did and her colleagues using this, this uh, intervention. It's on the next slide. This comes directly from their abstract of their research article. It says that relative to children assigned to a randomly assigned control group, kids who did more regular types of word recognition instruction, these kids uh, in this intervention, I call it a word ladder intervention, demonstrated significantly greater improvements in standardized tests of phonological awareness, word decoding, and interestingly enough, even comprehension. When students can, can figure out the words, there's a greater likelihood that comprehension is going to result there. But isn't that interesting, a result like that? Well, I'm kind of good at this, I have to admit. And I created, I, I kind of took this idea and, and, I, and I kind of turned it into my own version of uh, this word building, which, as I mentioned to you earlier, I call it word, ladder, word ladders. And again, if you have a, a slip of paper, a little sheet of paper, I'd like to do this with you guys. You might want to write this down as we go through it and do it with your own children uh, in the next week or so uh, here. So here's what I would like for you guys to do. At the top of your sheet, write the word happy, okay? If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands, that sort of thing, okay? Now what we're going to do 
is I'm going to have you write these words down, and we're going to make a series of, of words. Okay, so you guys ready? Okay, take away two letters from happy and make a word that describes um, things that you add to your iPhone or, or to your computer. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a clipped form of the word application. Take away two letters and you end up with, next slide, app. Very good. Now, rearrange the letters in app. Don't change them, just rearrange them and make a word. Is there another word for father or dad? That might be, next slide, pap. Very good. Now change a letter in PAP, change the last letter, and make a word that uh, describes the foot of a dog or a bear. That would be a paw, nicely done. Change a letter in PAW, let's change the vowel, and make a word that if you go into a church or a house of worship, place of worship, the seats are sometimes given this uh, special name, and that would be a pew. Okay, almost on here. Change the first letter in pew and make a word that describes the opposite of old is new. Okay, change one letter in new and make a word that describes when you go fishing. Uh, one way to catch a lot of fish is to use a net. Nicely done. And add a letter to net and make a word that means when something is tidy, we say it is neat, nicely done. Notice that we went from the short E to the long E on that one. We've discussed that. Okay, let's change the last letter in neat and make a word that means the opposite of uh, uh, opposite of far is near. Okay, and here's our last word. Change one letter in near and make a word that describes uh, 365 days make a year. Excellent, excellent. Now put the word happy and new and the last letter to get word together and what do you get? Happy New Year. Very good. So next slide there. Happy New Year. So you might want to try this in a couple weeks here or early next month with your students here. That's another word ladder. And I've got to admit I'm pretty good at these uh, word ladders. In fact I'm so good I published like four books on, on them and they're on the next slide. Shameless uh, promotion. They're called Daily Word Ladders by Scholastic and I, I've gotten such good feedback from those I just wanted to s s mention that word word study should be fun. It should be a game-like activity. So we got word building, uh, we have the whether it's word ladders or, or making and writing words, we have high frequency words. Another approach to word study would be looking at patterns, word patterns. And you know anybody who's talked about phonics for the last 25 years tells us that that uh, phonograms or rhymes, R I M E S, or word families are one of the best ways of approaching uh, uh, the teaching of, of phonics. You know th these are at what Ed Fry 16 years ago said are the most important word families to teach, the ones that have the greatest utility. If you teach children that A C K says ack and A B says ab and A G says ag. They will be able to spell and decode 654 one-syllable words just by tacking on a beginning consonant or a beginning consonant blend. That's a pretty good batting average. You teach kids these 36 word families, they got control over 600 plus words, and those are only the one-syllable words. What about the more, to, you know, those multi-syllabic words that our older kids have difficulty with? Well, then we have, you know, if you know that AM says am, you can figure out ham, salmon, jam, but you can also figure out Alabama, ambulance, hamster, camera, family, Amsterdam, you know, literally thousands of words have am in them that that word, that pattern can help you with. The question is though, how do you teach these to your students? Uh, let me let me share with you one quick way here. Suppose we're going to work on AG says ag. Next slide please. I got it pointed out there. Let's brainstorm with our class all the words you can make out of with the AG. So you can come up with words like bag and tag and rag and flag and baggage, agriculture, jaguar, and so on. And you put them on a, on display in a word wall and you practice reading those words at the beginning of the day, at lunchtime, after lunchtime, end of the day, and, and you're done. But you're going to have some students who still have difficulty identifying those words in real context. So we have this new con new idea in reading. It's not really a new idea. It's an old idea with a new name. It's called decodable books. We used to call them linguistic readers. Linguistic reader is nothing more than a, a word that is uh, 
uh, or a story written for the purpose of teaching a phonetic uh, uh, element. Here's an example of a decodable book. I, I noticed I just misspelled the title. It should be Mr. Crag. Mr. Crag's at the airport getting his uh, luggage, and it goes like this. Mr. Crag had a bag. Turn the page. Mr. Crag had a bag, and the bag had a tag. Page three. Mr. Uh, no, go back. Paid Mr. Craig found his bag and so on. It's, I, it's, it's, you wonder sometimes why kids hate reading and it's you know these these books that are written for that purpose you know that for teaching a, a phonetic element they they don't really have much of a story to them do they? And of course the next pay, day we're going to work on OG says Og so guess what we're going to read there? Miss Cog had a had a hog and Miss Cog had a hog and she put it on a log. Again, kind of a nonsense book uh, uh, there. I, I like this idea of a decodable book, but folks, we already have them. They're called poems and rhymes. I think the, my last uh, workshop or webinar I had with you, I talked about the importance of, of poetry and, and, and song because you know these are natural decodable texts. What I'd like for you to think about if you happen to be a kindergarten, first, even second grade teacher is to take all the poems you have available and organize them by word family. And then when it's time to teach, A, Y says A, bring out, you know, rain, rain, go away, come again another day, little Johnny wants to play, or I, G, H, T, starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight, I wish I may, I wish I might have the wish I wish tonight. These are, these are decodable texts also, but they're authentic and they're engaging and children have lots of fun. In fact, after a while, children can start writing their own uh, decodable texts or their own poetry. As, as uh, Greg once did, he worked on A, Y says A, so he wrote about bikes. Bikes that are ride all of the day, places to go so far away, sidewalks and paths, places to stray, riding a bike, what a great way to play. Does Greg know that A, Y says A? Is he developing fluency by reading this text over and over again? Does he see himself as a poet? See, again, that's this is the word study that should be engaging and authentic for our kids. Now we got another kind of pattern to work on also, and, and of course, if you turn to the next slide, I say, uh, oops, oh, I'm sorry, I kind of messed up here. Here's an example of these uh, decodable pack, the te text here. Suppose you're working on, you know, uh, IS. Uh, you might bring in. Uh, sing this song, you know, during the holidays. Sleigh bells ring. Are you listening? In the sleigh lane, snow is glistening. A beautiful sight. We're happy tonight, walking in a winter wonderland. Let go to the next slide and look what we could be teaching with this. I S T, as in list, wrist, mist, and cyst. Der, E N, as in hen, pen, den, and wind. I G H T, sight, right, tonight, it might. Even work on that W sound, as in walking in a winter wonderland. Uh, there. Look at what the the power we could get out of one text or one one poem or song that children would enjoy singing and would be tapped into the uh, uh, um, in the the time of the year that we have right now. But let's let's always mention earlier. Let's look at these other patterns. It's Greek to me is what I call it. The next next slide, please. You know, um, we have this these other patterns that are English words that are derived from from Latin and 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 Greek. Uh, and so I'm going to say it's not Greek to me, it should be Greek and Latin to our students. There. So next slide, because Latin is a big part of this as well. Do you know that 90% of our academic words in English are derived from Latin and Greek? 90%! Wow, most of your multisyllabic words in English, that's where they come from, Latin and Greek. So. I like to. There, there's a growing body of evidence in the Common Core uh, folks uh, uh, tell us this, that if you want to teach word knowledge, vocabulary, spelling, decoding, this is something we should be tapping into with our kids. Here's a quote that I found. And I can't tell you exactly where it's from, but next slide. This is what a scholar wrote. He said, the next quantum leap in vocabulary instruction and learning will come when we make a systematic effort to make and to make an effort to integrate Latin and Greek roots into our vocabulary and word study curriculum. Through beginning, not in high school, but in the primary grades and moving all the way through through the high school years. I've been working on this with my colleagues for several years now here at Kent State, and we've actually been writing some articles on this. Then the next one is one I'll be happy to share with you. I'll send it through Karen. Next slide. It's called Greek and Latin Roots, Keys to Building Voc or Latin and Greek Connection, Building Vocabulary Through Morphological Study. i like to show you how, how it might work here. Uh, the idea that if you teach one of these roots, it can help you with many 
many, many, many words here. Remember that making words activity that we just did earlier? Next slide. Remember we added ended with the word independence? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this uh, P-E-N-D. I have it underlined in box number 13, pinned. That is a Latin root. And what it means is, next slide, weigh, hang, or attach. You see the Romans would hate weigh things using those uh, the, the kind of scale we would use in a in, in a uh, science laboratory, you know, the, the, you had the fulcrum, the crossbar, and the two baskets, and those baskets hung on each side of the full, uh, on the, uh, the crossbar. And so the, the, those baskets were hung from, hence the idea of hanging or attaching uh, those baskets. So way hang or attach class whenever you see a pen. And we talked to the students, we said, what does independence have to do with way hang or attach? And of course, that's when, you know, King George with the Declaration, signers of the Declaration said, we no longer want to be attached to the British Empire. We don't want to hang around with you anymore, King George. Knowing that, then, what we did at the bottom of that sheet, then, next slide here, you see those bottom, bottom, those bottom uh, boxes there where it says uh, transfer words? What we did was we made a series of new words. Each had pinned in them. So we had words like pending. What does that mean? Something chronologically attached to what we're doing right now. What's pending? Well, we're going to have a little question and answer here in about two minutes here. How about a pen? When you append something to a document, you literally attach it to the document. Appendix, part of our colon attached to our colon. We don't know what, why it's there, what it does, just an attachment. Unless you don't have one, that's because you had appendicitis, in which case you have to have an appendectomy. Or appendage, about T4. What's that? A part of a body attached to the main part of our body. It's an appendage. How many appendages does an insect have? Pendant T5 is a word only the girls knew, and of course it's a piece of jewelry that is hung from a necklace. Uh, other pendulum sends us into Edgar Allan Poe, who wrote the pit and the pendulum. What's that? Students didn't know. I said it's part of a grandfather clock. What part's that? And of course, it's the part that hangs down. When we got into the word suspend, that's when the principal says to misbehaving children, don't want you to see you hanging around the playground anymore. You are no longer attached to the student body. Uh, of course, we also talk about light fixtures suspended from the ceiling. Suspenders, we all know it hangs from those, our pants. And then our last word is a pretty challenging one, compendium, a group of objects that hang together. We might talk about a compendium of music or a compendium of literature. They all hang together. They share a common characteristic. In fact, we are a compendium of educators. We share a passion uh, for teaching and passion for our, our kids. So you can see where you know, it's that, that, that batting average where you teach children one of these roots and, oh my gosh, it can help you with many, many, many words there. So where have we been? We've just a short uh, uh, seminar, webinar, and I'm going to have uh, to to close it up here in a, a minute or so. But if we go to the next next slide here, what what did we cover here? If you want to build a phonics and word recognition instruction program that really works, these are things I hope you'll consider. Uh, put in a, a program for teaching high frequency words, especially to our K1, 2, and 3 students, because these are so important that kids learn these words as quickly as possible. Uh, think of the word building games that we can involve our students. Making words, and uh, making writing words. Now, if you, uh, we didn't talk about making words, but that's Patricia Cunningham's uh, activity, and all you need to do is search making words on your internet, and it'll take you to a whole bunch of information that Pat Cunningham's written about it. Making and writing words is my iteration, or my, or my tweaking Pat Cunningham's version of this, and that's that activity we did with independence. We could do the word building uh, games, such as the daily word ladders, and those are lots of fun to do as well. Uh, there we talked about the word patterns, uh, the rhymes, the phonograms, and using poems and songs and other rhythmical texts to, to reinforce those with their students. And then, then going to the next level of word patterns, these Latin and Greek roots here. It's, if we begin to think of word recognition instruction and phonics instruction this way as as activities that uh, that that engage students, we're we're not only going to develop in our students uh, knowledge of words, but I think even more important than that, we're going to develop in them a love of words. Maybe turn them into word nerds, just like me, and just like many of you out there. So, if you're interested, I I'm going to plug another book for myself. It's on the next slide there, Tammy. 
Um, it's called Essential Strategy, Strategies for Word Study by Scholastic. It's a collection of about 25 or so of these word strategies, several of them we talked about just now here. It gives you a little bit more detail on them and uh, it can easily be implemented in just about any classroom. So I'm going to close it off there and uh, go to the next slide. My contact information is there at the bottom of that page or in the middle, tresinsk at kint.edu. If any of you have any questions or follow-ups, please feel free to contact me. And I also have a website. It's right there at the bottom. It's www.timrosinski.com. And if you go there, I'll make this homework for those of you who are, have, uh, are listening. Uh, click on where it says Presentation Materials. And I've got a lot of different things that you might be able to incorporate into your own classroom uh, there. So I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to turn it back over to Karen and see if there's any questions or comments or thoughts. But I want to thank you all for listening to, to, to my webinar today. And I wish you the uh, happy and, and safe and restful holidays. And, and, uh, and, and I hope that 2015 will be a, a fantastic year for all of us. Karen? Um, back to you. Okay, thank you so much, Tim. As, as always, it's fun and fascinating, um, the kinds of uh, techniques that you provide for us. Um, I think you probably did answer this question within uh, the content, um, but somebody was asking, where can I find word ladder books for grades one through three? You want to just review that again? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, I forgot. I uh, the, uh, the the, uh, the the slide there was up there. Uh, Scholastic sells them, so you can either go to Scholastic.com or Amazon.com and uh, just search word ladders, and it, it should instantly pop up there. And, th and they they usually sell them for a discount, so you can get them at a at a, at a real reasonable price uh, there. So that that was an easy question to answer. But I will tell you that uh, um, um, it is a game, and the way I developed these was actually by being sick several years ago. I was, I was stuck at home with the flu and I had nothing to do and I started watching the game show channel and I, I got on this program called Lingo. If you ever watch Lingo, you've done a word ladder and I got hooked on words and how they're spelled and what do they mean and and, and I just started playing around with them and I thought and I found out that I could you know create these word ladders pretty easily so and I enjoy doing them. And I, I'll mention one other thing though. You know those of you who you know, play on your you know words with friends or some of these uh, games that are either were online or the newspaper on your phone. Do you ever notice something about that? That if you do it regularly, these games you get better at it. Well, we have a special name for that. We call it learning when you get better at something. And so, you know, when we can create these game-like activities and students do get better at it, you you have evidence that they are that they are actually uh, learning the content that we want them to learn in terms of words. Okay. Any others? Sure. Um, we've got one here. Dr. Brzezinski, I really like your strategies for word study. How oh, do I put these all together and fit them with what I am already doing to create a comprehensive word study curriculum? Yeah, Tammy, can you go back a couple uh, slides here if it's uh, uh, possible here? Uh, where we have the list, the next previous. Okay, so these are the things that we talked about uh, in our short webinar here, and that's an excellent question. You know, because many of you already are are um, you you have word study activities that you're using with your students, and you know you say, well, how can I fit these in? I don't I don't know if I have time, and and you know that is a tough question. But I will tell you this: this is the way I like to approach it. I can tell you that there's pretty there's evidence to support each of these uh, activities, uh, and so we can call these you know the scientific basis for teaching of, of words. But the thing is that you know teaching is not just a science; it's an art, and that's that's the challenge that I'm going to pose to everybody who's listening. Uh, think of these activities here or these approaches as colors on your palette. You need to choose the ones that you think have the greatest utility for your students and meet your own style of teaching. Uh, 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 there and and choosing, and I would just say you know take one or two and between now and and when when the, when the holiday break comes up here in a few weeks and try with your kids and, and for ten minutes or so a day and see if if they appeal to them and if they if they do appeal to your students then uh, uh, then go with it you know make, integrate it into your existing curriculum but but again I, I you know it's something that. I think it's a decision you have to make for yourself, which are the ones that I think will have the greatest impact. I will tell you, though, that 
you know, the, the word ladders, we do these with students daily. They only take a few minutes. We, we've been working more and more with these so, uh, Latin and Greek word families, even with our younger children. We had some first grade children in Akron that have been working a day, a week, one of these uh, Latin roots like BI meaning two and TRI meaning three. Um, you know, one per week, and, and just making a list of words that 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 um, have those word, you know, that contain that those particular word families. But it is a challenge, and and but but think of yourself as not just a scientist, and but as an artist, and how can we weave these into our um, our already existing curriculum and and make it fun for our kids. Okay, wonderful. Uh, time for one more. Um, right. Shouldn't teaching the Latin and Greek word patterns be reserved for the middle grades and beyond? You know, that was my first thought because I took Latin in high school. And, you know, and, and I, I often mention that even though I can't speak a word of Latin right anymore, I, I've, you know, from, from, from that day on in, in high school, I would notice words in English. So, you know, typically we think of Latin and to a lesser extent Greek as being, you know, secondary or even college level subjects. But we've been, we've been bringing this down, as I just mentioned in my previous comment, even into second and first grade. You know, one of the things Pat Cunningham says a lot is she says that the brain is a pattern detector. We know, you know, we have this almost innate ability to see patterns in our environments, whether it's, you know, in our uh, looking the way around a, a room might be arranged in a pattern or, a, or a, you know, visual pattern or a linguistic pattern. So we ought to take advantage of that with our, with our children. Uh, I like to say that the, the Romans and the Greeks didn't say to their children, sorry, we can't teach you our, our, our language until you get into high school. You know, they started from day one. So, you know, the take advantage of that idea that our, we have this n n uh, natural ability to, to see patterns, even, you know, in, down into first grade. I think next year we're even going to try bringing this into kindergarten, some of those prefixes, you know, that we, we teach our children. So, you know, you need to be a little uh, aggressive on this, you know, one root a week. Um, and, I'll, and I will admit not every child will... We'll pick up on these, uh, but here's what I think happens, even in first and second grade, when you teach one of these roots per week, I, I like to say you're priming the pump, so that when children encounter these roots again in, say, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, they've already got some background for them, and so th then they're going to be ready to absorb them like a sponge. But um, for those of you who are working in the primary grades, be bold and, 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 and try these. Try with the, you know, that BI means two class and make a list of all those BI words like biplane and biceps and binoculars and bi, biathlete and so on. And then the next week, tr uh, tr try, 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 T-R-I, try. So you have triathlon and tricycle and so on. And, and see if your kids can begin to pick up on it. Our, what, our evidence from Akron has been really amazing. It's just neat to see. Uh, children take to take in, in in these patterns. So we 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 can we can go we certainly go go down into the elementary grades with these. I think I'm losing my voice, Karen. Okay. Well, it's at the end of our time anyway. Um, again, thank you so much, Tim, and uh, thank you to all of you who participated. Uh, as I said, uh, you will soon be receiving an email uh, with an the way to fill out a questionnaire. Um, survey type thing. And once you're finished with that, in about a week or so, you will be receiving via an email a certificate um, with your contact hour. So again, on behalf of everybody here at PSI, thank you so much for attending. Karen, can I interrupt for a second? Sure. Karen? Sure. I'm here. Oh, is it too late? Oh, if I send you that article, a couple articles, uh, can you send those out to people as well? Sure. With the... Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'll try to get those to you tomorrow. Okay. okay. We'll figure okay. out a way to get that done. Thank you, Tim. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you for attending this webinar. The a copy of this webinar, if you were unable to listen to all of it, will be available.